about your children. How wonderful that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a seat. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad I'm here too. So here's the deal. So women for states and men too. And men too. So I was just sitting at home having a really good life and asking myself what could I do that could be of value, could be of service. And I've been watching what's been going on down here. Y'all about to make some history down here. Y'all doing some pre-voting. Getting out there canvassing and helping everybody. Don't pull me off the stage, thank you. And helping everybody. So, so here's the deal. I am an independent woman. I earned the right to be independent. Uh, I, I think for myself. I don't do what anybody tells me to do unless I want to do it. Nobody told me to be here. Nobody even asked me to be here. So I, you know, everybody, no, no, I, I know three people in Georgia. <laughs> Tyler Perry makes yeah. two of them, so I'm like, <laughs> well, Tyler, I say, Tyler, do you, you, you know, you know Stacey Abrams? He goes, yeah, I kind of know her. Uh, I go, well, do you know her enough to have her phone number? Well, no, I don't have a phone number. Okay, okay, bye. <laughs> Will Packer, he, he knows, he knows Stacey Abrams. But do you have a phone number? I had to find somebody who knew somebody that knew somebody that had Stacey's phone number. So when I get Stacey's phone number, which was just three days ago. Three days ago. I call her up on the cell. I say, hi Stacey, this is Oprah Winfrey. She said, girl, let me pull over. <laughs> Which is good. You're supposed to pull over. Especially if you think it might be something exciting. So she pulled over and I told her that I wanted to come here to give my support. Is that okay? <laughs> she said it was okay. And that is why I'm here. I'm here because I have seen Stacey Abrams from afar. I've been reading about her, I've been reading about her in Atlanta papers, I've been reading about her and read about her in the New York Times. Y'all saw that beautiful Stacey Abrams on the cover of Time Magazine. <laughs> and what I saw was that in spite of all the haters, coming at her, in spite of all the vitriol, in spite of all the attack ads, here stands this strong, bold, bodacious African-American woman. <laughs> who just, in the words of Sterling Brown's poem, you know that poem where he says strong men keep a coming on? Strong women keep a coming, keep a coming, keep a coming on, keep a coming on, keep a coming on, and no matter what they throw at her, she just keeps a coming, keeps a coming on. And standing for the values that matter to all of us. So I'm here as an independent who made my own decision, paid my own way, nobody paid for me to be here, and I have approved this message. <laughs> approved this message because I came to support Stacey Abrams because the reason I'm a registered independent is because I believe everybody should actually vote your values. You should vote your values and vote your conscience regardless of what the party says. You know in your own spirit if you got one. 
and everybody has one. A lot of people don't pay attention to what it's saying. Your own spirit tells you what is right and what is wrong. And you know all this attack, uh, all these attack methods, all of this fear-based propaganda is set up just to confuse and confound you. And so you know when you see somebody who's been raised right, like Stacey Abrams, who has come to serve the underserved. So I'm here because Stacey Abrams cares about what matters to me and what matters to people in the state of Georgia that care about other people. I'm here because she plans to strengthen environmental protection so that our children can have clean, safe water. I'm here because she plans to create at least 45,000 high wage jobs in alternative energy. I'm here because she's for keeping families together and she supports a pathway to citizenship for undocumented human beings. I'm here because she recognizes that Georgia has a problem and because the people of this state need expanded Medicaid. You see, I also understand that all of us have been created equal. I believe that in, in, in my soul. But I also have some sense and know that if you are uh, uh, woke, you don't even have to be fully woke, just a little bit awake. <laughs> You're just a little bit awake. You recognize as a, as a citizen, as a universal human of the planet, that not everybody gets treated equally. And if you've been blessed as I've been blessed, being been blessed, you can raise your hand, been blessed, you know you've been blessed. The reality is, Part of your responsibility is to look out for others who haven't been as blessed as you. And so, when you see injustices in the world, big and small, we see them every day, a lot of people think there's nothing you can do about injustice. I'm here to tell you that the saying that says, this land was made for you and me, that's not just a saying, that's not just a song, that is the truth. This land was made for you and me. And every single one of us has something that if it's done in numbers too big to tamper with, we cannot be suppressed. And we cannot be denied, and we will not, as, 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 as the civil rights leaders used to say, we shall not even be moved. We shall not be moved. So every single one of us, I'm here to remind you, that every one of us, no matter what your background, no matter what God you pray to, no matter what your skin color, no matter whether you graduated, have a PhD or no D, whether, whether <laughs> how much money's in your bank account, all of that is meaningless when you go to the polls because we have equality in the polls. And on November 6th, you get the chance to use the ultimate powerful democratic right and privilege that we all carry, and that is to vote. And everybody who's here, y'all came out here in the rain. You already know the truth. So your job is going to be to spread the truth to other people. That's what we're here for. I, I am Oprah Winfrey going door to door, hoping nobody slams the door in my face. Because I see it as my responsibility to help spread the truth. And I gotta say that for many years, I was like a lot of young people and a lot of other people who feel like, oh, I voted, I didn't vote, I didn't have time to vote, that's okay. And then in my 20s, uh, a, 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 a speech, microphone, I heard the speech sermon. Do you know Reverend Otis Moss, Cleveland? Man can preach. And Reverend Moss was telling the story about his father who was raised in Troop County, Georgia. I don't even know where that is, but. Okay, LaGrange. 
thank you for knowing where that is. Anyway, his father wanted the right to vote because there was a governor at the time, Eugene Aldridge, I think it was. Talmadge, Eugene, thank you so much for the correction. Eugene Talmadge. And he, he, according to Reverend Moss, Eugene Talmadge used the N-word like he was talking about ice cream and cake. And his father wanted to have the right to vote Eugene Talmadge out of office. At a time when he knew it was dangerous as a black man to even try to vote. So his father gets dressed in his one suit and his best tie to walk to LaGrange to vote. And he gets to the precinct and is told after walking six miles, you in the wrong place, boy. You got to go to another town. He goes to that town and they tell him you in the wrong place, boy. He then continues walking. By now it's dusk and he goes, he says, to the Rosemont High School. Maybe some of y'all know what that was. It was all white high school at the time. And he gets there and they say, sorry boy, too late. The polls have closed. So all told, his father walked 18 miles in one day for the chance to vote. So just imagine that for a moment. You get up at the crack of dawn, you put on your best suit because you're gonna go vote. You're walking, your feet are tired. You're tired, but you want the chance to vote. And you get there and they tell you no. And you try and you try again. And by the time the day was over, he couldn't vote. And by the time the next election came around, he had passed and could not. So I tell you, after I heard that story in my mid-20s, I have not missed a vote. Because I vote for Otis Moss Sr., a man who I never knew, who didn't get the chance. And I vote for my grandmother, Hattie Mae Lee, who died in 1963 before the Voting Rights Act. I vote for her, I vote for every relative who ever tried, who ever wanted. I vote for every person who ever imagined they could and every slave who knew they couldn't. When I go and vote in the, in, in, at the polls, I vote and stand, as Maya Angelou used to say, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000 for those 10,000 who didn't have the chance. And I have to say this to you, black people with ancestors who never had the chance. When you sit at home and your friends sit at home and you don't get up and go vote, you disrespect your elders, you disregard your history, you disgrace their legacy. When you don't vote for what they were lynched for, discriminated against, humiliated for, turned down, turned back for, and you can't get up and go vote, you dishonor your legacy. You dishonor your legacy. So what we gonna do November 6th? We're gonna bring honor to the legacy. And black people, white people, brown people, Asian people, LGBTQ people, we gonna do it in the name of Stacey Abrams. We're gonna do it because we're gonna make history. And all those ancestors and the women the women who just got the right, we, we listen, and it has not been a hundred years. White women, listen to me. <laughs> there was a time where you couldn't even own a piece of property without your daddy saying you could. There was a time where we couldn't own ourselves. Our voices meant nothing. And so united as sister women people, 
We can make changes. We know we have discernment. We know this crazy talk in the world is just that. And we know that we have an antidote to the crazy. Oh, yeah. We got an antidote called Stacey Abrams. And she's ready. She's ready, because I've been talking to her parents. You know, she's been raised right. She's been, she, she been working a long time. This didn't just happen. You don't just get up and get bold enough to say, I'm going to run for the governor of the state of Georgia and all that that means. So I'm here to introduce to you the dynamically inspired, bold and bodacious. She is a warrior woman for your state, Stacey Abrams. at this wonderful little farm to table place and I had the great pleasure of sitting with Stacy's parents. I wish I, I had still had the Oprah show. I would just do an hour on the Oprah show. <laughs> <laughs> Stacy's parents, please stand, let the audience. <laughs> so earlier I, I asked you the question about what had prepared you. Now, now I know what prepared you. Yes. You came from parents who got you ready, who have been working in their own way for justice, equal rights, civil rights, your whole life. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Robert and Carolyn Abrams are the most extraordinary people I've ever known. Yes. So when I asked your father over lunch, was he surprised at all? He said, I'm gonna ask you again. Ha, this looks like this over shot. Here's your moment. Oh, God. <laughs> I ask you, were you surprised about your daughter? Let's turn around so everybody can see you. Were you surprised that this is happening to your daughter? No. <laughs> I am not surprised. Stacey was born to be president. <laughs> That's all I got to say. She will be governor. There's no doubt in my mind. Stacy will be governor. Thank you very much. Get her governor before we move on to president. Thank you. Let's do that first. <laughs> so, what you know, I think that you, the reason I got off my couch and came down here is because I could feel something happening that uh, I sense that you were made, you were built for such a time as this. So, do you feel that too? I, I when I go outside and knock on doors, when we travel to Troop County, to Henry County, down to Colquitt, and over to Dade County, this is our moment. We know that, there, I, I was speaking at churches, and because of my, my parents, there's a scripture that comes to mind, it's um, Micah 3, and it's the story of Israel when its leaders suddenly start forgetting who they're supposed to be leading, and it's the story of a powerful nation that falls into the grip of people who, as the scripture says, who love evil and hate good. And what it tells us is that the people have the responsibility for turning things right side up. And I think about how my parents raised us to volunteer. I, I used to you know, be really frustrated because I would miss the super friends on Saturdays because uh, my mom and dad would take us out to volunteer and we're like, we're poor too. Um, and my mom would say, no matter how little we have, there is someone with less. Your job is to serve that person. Uh, my father's, thank you, my dad's more succinct way of putting it was having nothing is not an excuse for doing nothing. But 
But what they did was lead us by example. They raised us to see a problem and solve it. They raised us to see poverty and be offended by it. But they also raised us, my mom would take us in to vote with her. She would pick us up after school and it would be like make way for ducklings because there's six of us. And we'd be like trailing out of the voting booth. But my parents wanted us to see them vote because they knew that the power that they could put forward as civic leaders doing good work was insufficient unless you had good leaders on the government side that would make it not necessary for them to do what they did. And that's, that's why this moment is so important. Yes. Why do you think, though, that so many people have not understood this, not just this midterm, but all midterms to be significant? I, we were discussing this earlier that I think a lot of people are confused about what the federal government does and what their actual state representatives, what the governors do, yes. So we spend billions of dollars explaining the federal government. We know who the president is because we spend billions of dollars learning about the presidency. We know what Congress is supposed to do because Schoolhouse Rock taught us so. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you know, if we're lucky, we have extraordinary exemplars like Congressman John Lewis, Congressman Hank Johnson. <laughs> But we're rarely told what a governor does. Um, and you know, when you and I were talking, you know, one thing I, I, I point out to folks, the stand your ground laws that took children from parents did not happen in Congress. It happened because the governor of Florida, that the erosion of the social safety net that says you get to be poor for three years and then we're done with you, that didn't happen in DC. That happened first under Governor Tommy Thompson in Wisconsin. And mass incarceration was not created by the 1994 crime law. It was started under Ronald Reagan as the governor of California. And so what we have to understand is that the local challenges we see are indeed local, that they were created often by our legislators, by our governors, and that our states are the incubators sometimes for evil. And therefore, we can be the engineers of good if we have the right local leaders in place to think of those ideas and make them so. The question is, can we, can you, can you, as governor, continue to be uh, an engineer of good in the face of such divisiveness, in the face of such anger, such... I, I think so. I mean, I've had seven years as the Democratic leader, and they put it in my title. They don't call you Democratic leader. They call you minority leader. It sounds like an oxymoron. I mean, basically, it's like, you're going to lose. But one of the reasons I was successful was that I refused to believe that we can't find ways to work together. Um, it, it sometimes frustrated my colleagues because where I start is that we have to find ways to work together. Mm -hmm. That collaboration is the first responsibility, cooperation. And that's why, I, you know, you clap for that. <laughs> You know, I, I, I refuse to believe that, that my party is the possessor of all good ideas. I refuse to believe that race or class or gender or sexual orientation are markers of success or failure. And therefore, if you believe that we are equal, you have to then believe that we can work together. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I sat at Temple Emmanuel on, on Sunday, uh, worshiping with a Jewish congregation and mourning for their compatriots in Pittsburgh. And you know that rabbi, the rabbis that spoke, the rabbis that sang, sang of unity. They sang of the importance of us being together. And they invited me, a Christian, to participate in their mourning. Across this country, Muslim communities were donating because they understood how that vitriol could be so corrosive to all of us. And it is in those moments that we are required to not only own our humanity, but to assert it. And it's easy to assert it in times of mourning. It is more responsible and more necessary to assert it in times of politics. Because in moments of division, if you agree to the division, you are part of the problem. Our responsibility is to be part of the solution. So I, I know we've all heard you speak about faith, and I know you come from parents who, who were pastors. Has, has your faith been tested for even you? Oh, God, time? yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the first time you turn on television and you hear yourself described in not flattering terms and not with pretty photos. Um, 
I'm like, where did they find that picture and how could I have looked that bad? Um, but it's also when, when people look at your record and take it, or your words, and take them out of context and you wonder if your faith is going to be rewarded. Not, not that, I, I pray to God for victory. I pray that he will allow me to, to ascend and to take this position. But what I don't want to have happen is that my race becomes a record for the diminution of all of us. And it's hard sometimes to not think that in this moment, if I don't succeed, that somehow I have failed everyone. And, and that's, I think, the real test of faith, that, that you've got to believe that regardless of the outcome, the race is what's important. But I still want to win, and I want God, let's be clear. <laughs> So in the operation and leadership of running this race, have made decisions about a certain way you're going to operate. Yes. I mean, that's what I noticed from afar. Thank you. Yes. So we started this campaign in June of 2017, and we took a lot of uh, heat from political pundits, from colleagues who said that we were doing it the wrong way. We were spending a lot of money on infrastructure. We were hiring people to go to communities that didn't typically vote in primaries. My campaign manager, a brilliant woman named Lauren Girl Wargo, she and I, yes. <laughs> Lauren and I have been working together since 2012, and we both believe fundamentally that the change that we need has to come from valuing and respecting every voter. And therefore, we began our campaign. Number one, we said we were going to talk about the same issues from beginning to end. I haven't had to convert, pivot, adjust. I've talked about education, jobs, and health care. But more than that, we have resisted the opportunities to be mean and ugly. That sometimes it's hard, and that's the time when prayer is so necessary. Um, but but you know, there there are these moments where you can do something that might catapult you, but it also lessens you. Yes. And what we've tried to be is the campaign that we can respect. At the end of the day, if someone who looked at that campaign, they would not question our values. They would not question whether my parents raised me right. Yes. Uh, they would know that we ran the most honorable race that you can imagine for the people of Georgia. Yes, and, and in the end, I'm here because I believe and want you to win, but in the end, what really matters is that you were not willing to lose your soul. Exactly. exactly. We're not willing to That's lose exactly. your soul. We're not willing to lose your soul. So the election's gonna be close. What is it, what, what's it gonna take to win it? I need more people than he does. <laughs> but but here, he, thank you. But but here's the thing, those, of, those who are here today, those who were in Cobb County earlier today, you guys are the true believers. What we need are the ones who don't know that there's even a story to be believed. We need the ones who don't understand that it's your state representative that decides whether or not a city can be created out of whole cloth it's your state representative and your governor who decides whether money's going to your school for wraparound services. They need, but they need you all to tell them. They, what, what is so important about this moment and what is so deeply meaningful to me in having you here is that we've got this audience of people who can go out and be ambassadors and acolytes, and you're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> at getting people to understand their role in speaking truth. Because it's not the people who already know what to do. It's the people who don't know that they should know what to do. And that's what this job takes. It takes everyone in this room talking to people that they don't normally talk to or folks that they don't talk politics with. Because politics is, we're all political, whether we know it or not. Um, you know, the, the, the famous saying, you're either at the table or you are on the menu. <laughs> and for a lot of our communities, they've been on the menu for a while. It's just bones now. But... <laughs> The thing, though, that, you know, I, I literally was sitting at home thinking, what can I do? I think that's a really important question for everybody here that you can help answer. What can I do? So for me, it was like, let me find Stacey Abrams' phone number. Let me, let me call <laughs> Stacey Abrams. Let me, let me see what I could do. Let's see if I can go down and do something, you know? So canvassing was one of the things I could do. Coming down, talking to you all was one of the things I could do. But to actually ask that question, because 
you know, everybody's on Twitter giving their hashtag for blah 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 blah. blah and my thing is, don't speak unless you can actually be heard. Yes. Use your voice when it's actually going to matter. So how do the people in this room answer that question of what can I do? Because how many of you have already voted, pre-voted? Okay, so a lot of pre-voted. Everybody here is gonna vote. What else can we do? So if you have a cell phone, and I can see a lot of them taking pictures. Um, if you text blue GA to nine, Seven 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 nine. Good job. That will tell you how we need you to volunteer. In the next five days, we need to reach every single possible supporter. That means we're going to need people knocking on doors. We're going to need people making phone calls. And we're going to need people sending text messages. Those are the three ways we turn out voters. And, and let, me, let me tell you just how extraordinary Oprah Winfrey is in case you have missed humanity in, in life. So... When she called, and I didn't have the car crash, um, and, but I did have a small stroke, um, she asked me what she could do to help, and, and I dreamed so small. I was like, well, you send out a tweet. Like, that was, like, dude, I wasn't even asking for Facebook. I just wanted to tweet. And her response was, no, I want to knock doors. And I'm like, of people? <laughs> And then she said, and I want to do a town hall. And I'm like, but you're Oprah. <laughs> but but my, my point is this. It is that each of you, you're thinking I can do this small thing. What she has done today is not about me. She's here for you all. She's here because she believes that you're, her, you're hearing her voice. And so I need y'all to all be Oprah. <laughs> I need you to go beyond the tweet and the Facebook. I need you to knock doors. I know it's raining. We know it's probably going to rain on Tuesday. That's why we've got to get people to vote tomorrow. <laughs> but we also need people to know that if they vote on Tuesday, we will pick them up in our cars and get them to the polls. I need you to make phone calls because not everybody lives in Atlanta. I know it feels like it at 5 p.m. on 285. but no. <laughs> and so we need folks calling into those communities that are often left out of our politics. That's why our campaign has been to 159 counties. But we need calls in all those communities. And then I need y'all to talk to people you don't like. I need you to talk to people you're mad at, even if you don't remember why. I need you to call people you broke up with. People you want to go out with. This is a great dating opportunity. Great dating opportunity. <laughs> May I say, let's just hit that note one yeah. more time. <laughs> Great dating opportunity. Yes. <laughs> How would you propose if you were somebody you're interested in? What and you... I would say, <laughs> as, as a writer of romance songs. Yes, as a writer, writer of romance songs. <laughs> I would begin by setting a conflict. I've heard tell that you don't actually believe in democracy. Is that true? <laughs> and when that person responds and says, that's not true, well, I need you to prove it to me. <laughs> I need you to canvas with me. I need you to knock doors with me. And then I need you to feed me. So. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Stacy. I was just thinking as you were saying that, let's go canvassing and then let's go out for tequila shots. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. We're going to open it up to questions. I heard there's some questions in the audience. Lights up so we can see the paper. <laughs> lights up. Okay, while, while you're all getting the lights up for the, for the, for the quest questions, I wanted to know about that romance novel <laughs> writing. Is that just a, that's a pleasure of yours that you? It, it started out as one. I, I, my mom was a librarian when we were growing up. My dad used to tell us he's, oh yeah, you can clap for librarians, they're awesome. <laughs> And so my mom would have us read, and she let me read pretty much anything I could. If I could reach it, I could read it. And my dad would tell us these very like, just engaging stories. My dad was Game of Thrones before there was Game of Thrones. He would tell these complicated stories, and, but not G-rated Game of Thrones, let me be clear. Um, but I, so I always wanted to be a storyteller, and in law school, I wanted to publish my first novel, in part because uh, this boy broke my heart in college, and yes, he was... Boo, yeah. Um, 
But and where is when, he now? See, this I is the I don't way. know and I don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was determined that when he saw me again, he would be very regretful of his decision making. And so the th three things I wanted to do, I wanted to be very successful, like this woman I was watching on TV named Oprah. Oh, um, nice. I wanted to be a best-selling novelist, and I wanted to run for some higher office. Uh, at the time, I thought I wanted to be mayor of Atlanta. Um, and so writing the novel seemed the most accessible and easiest thing to do first. So in law school, I wrote a book, and they bought it, and then they bought a few more. I will say that after I started writing for profit, <laughs> It ceased to be as much fun because they either wanted a book or their money back. Um, <laughs> and usually the money was gone. So, um, but, but I do, um, writing is cathartic to me. It's, it's one of the ways I can sort of you know, soothe my soul when I'm not watching TV or doing something else. But I, I love writing. I, I can't imagine not being a writer. Have you been able to, in the process of the campaign and everything that comes with that, hold on to the center of yourself? Have you been able to do that? I, I have, and, and it was in a weird way. So I, I wrote a book earlier during the primary, actually. Do not try this at home. That was the dumbest thing I've ever done. But I wrote this book uh, during the primary, and it was in the midst of um, some of the toughest parts of this campaign because the general election, everybody's on your side because you've, everyone you think is going to be on your side tends to be on your side. In the primary, you're sifting between friends. Yeah. And you're calling people that you have known, that you thought you've loved, who you thought have loved you for a long time, and over and over again, I would have these people that I'd known for years tell me that they weren't going to be supporting me, and it was it was um, it would be well, Stacy, I know you're smart and you're talented, but you're a black woman. I'm like I know. <laughs> um, but what they were telling me over and over again was that they they thought that race and gender would be disqualifiers for me. And these are people I thought would have faith in me. And so wow. it was hard to hold the center and it was hard to hold myself. But because I was in the process of writing this book, I was able to take that pain and really think about what lessons can I learn from it? What lessons? What do you actually say on the phone when somebody says, I'm not going to vote for you because you know, you're a black woman? Do you say, okay. It, it depends. <laughs> or I mean, look, for some, when it was, this is why I'm not supporting you, and... And they would actually say, I'm not supporting oh, you. Oh, they brother. would be very clear that they... So some some were wow. more um, ambiguous about it. They were like, well, let me think about it, which means, no, I'm not going to do it, but I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. But the ones who were clear, I would I would probe them. Like, what is it about me? And they were like, well, it's not me. It's Georgia. And I said, but you are part of Georgia. And so what I, I wouldn't try to convince them, because if you have to convince someone to do something they, if they've known you for that long, they, they don't want to be convinced. And so my job wasn't to convince them. My job was to give them something to think about so when I came back after I won, they would remember it. But, but to your question, what, it, what I would do is probe them and I would say, you know, I need you to, I really want to understand what it is about these things because I'm not asking you to be Georgia. I'm asking you to be you. Mm -hmm. And even if George is not going to support me, you're telling me you won't support me. Whoa. And, and that, I mean, that, that's corrosive. It can hurt for a long time, and it, it's hard to repair that kind of trust. And also to keep going. Yes. Just to keep going. Part of running for office is you got to call a whole lot of people. That's a whole lot of no's. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was, it was a, and you, in the beginning of a campaign, your first job is to call all the people you know. And so I was calling a lot of people I thought I knew who had the same story and had the same reaction. But it was the bright spots of calling folks like Hank Johnson, calling folks like John Lewis, who were willing to say yes. Um, Representative John Lewis is just, he's just our hero. He's an American yes. hero. He's a, yes. Stand up. So great to see you here today. And so what this must mean to you, being our representative from the state of Georgia, and now seeing Stacy running for governor after all you've seen and known, what, what would you ever imagine an African-American woman? Oprah. Yes. 
my dear. This, uh, this means everything to me. Everything. It makes me cry. Really? To see a talent, charming, smart, young black woman. Running for governor in the state of Georgia. Georgia! In Georgia. When people, when many people in this state and other parts of the South could not register to vote, when they were asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap, yeah. and the number of jelly beans in a jar, and just stay sick, go for it, bring it home. All right, any questions in the audience? Yes. Uh, at this moment, Stacy and dear Oprah, I am just overwhelmed. <laughs> at my age, I'm 83 years old. And we, we said at one time that we would never, we didn't even think about a black man being president. <laughs> but up came Obama. And now here you come. Yeah. You gonna make it. Keep it coming on. Keep it coming on. Now, let me ask you my question, and I know this is, this is you. You're going to take care of this. Stacy. I better. <laughs> Education. I'm an old retired teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Stacy. Education is the most important issue for me as a teacher. For so many of us. The cost of a college degree, my dear keeps rising, and it's getting to be out of, it's already out of reach for all of us, for a lot of people, for my grandchildren in my community. Now, what are you going to do to help? Well, y'all might have heard, I'm in a little bit of debt myself. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> <I> <laughs> and, and, and so here's the question. What has being in debt yourself taught about, taught you for yourself and about other people's debt? Sure. So part of what has happened, I went to some really good expensive schools. I went to, okay, y'all don't stop because we will never leave this room. I went to Spelman College. Y'all are hard headed. I went to Spelman College. I went to the University of Texas at Austin. I went to Yale Law School. I owe all of them money back. And, but I had an extraordinary education that allowed me to become a tax attorney. It allowed me to leave that job and become a deputy city attorney and take a pay cut. But it also put me in a position when my mother and father uh, faced challenges because of Hurricane Katrina and needed a little bit of extra help. I was able to step in and make sure that they had very, <laughs> had very good health care and health insurance coverage. Uh, because without that coverage, this is before President Obama and the coverage for pre-existing conditions. My parents, you know, my mother had six children. That is a pre-existing condition. Uh, my father had fallen off of a scaffolding at his job as a shipyard worker. And so without their health insurance, without me stepping in and paying those premiums, they likely would have been denied access to any coverage they needed in the future. And so part of what I've learned is that debt is a tool. If you're rich, debt is considered a mark of greatness. If you're poor, it's considered a mark of, of inadequacy. But I refuse to let people tell me that my debt disqualified me from this job. Yeah. You all know there is nobody better at balancing a checkbook than somebody without enough money. Because when you've got to pay Peter and Paul and John and her cousin, you know how to make decisions. You know how to set priorities. And when it comes to education, my mission is to make certain that our young people can graduate from college without being saddled by debt in a way that tells them they can't have ambition. And so I, want, I worked hard in 2011 to save the Hope Scholarship, to save the B average when they tried to make it such a high bar. But that wasn't enough. We, in addition to the existing Hope Scholarship, our next job is to join 48 other states and create need-based aid in the state of Georgia. Because 
I, I had good grades, but look, I come from a family that consisted of some strong C's and some D's doing the best they can. And if you're willing to work to go to college, we should be willing to work alongside you. But it's not just for your college. It's also making certain that technical college is free in Georgia once again. It used to be free and it should be again. And then third, it's recognizing that not everyone who graduates from our high schools is going to our colleges. And that's why I want us to create 22,000 apprenticeships by 2022 so that we can have folks who are trained for the film industry, for those transportation jobs, for those skilled labor jobs. But the larger learning is that for all of us, we need leaders who've actually experienced the lives we lead. We need people who haven't forgotten what it's like to have to make tough choices. And we want people who don't want you to have to decide between medicine and putting gas in the car, between food on the table and whether you can take a risk. I want any entrepreneur in here to be able to take that risk and start you know, a small media company that turns into a global dominion. We want folks to have those opportunities, but they can't if they feel so saddled by debt and also so ashamed of that debt that they're afraid to take risks. Debt taught me to take risk. Debt's not fatal. What's fatal is walking away from your responsibilities. I don't do that. I meet my obligations. I keep my promises, even if other people don't show up. Snap, snap. <laughs> snap, snap. We got that. All right, where's our other question? Who has a microphone? Hello. Hi. My Hi. Name, ooh, that's a lot. Ooh. My name is Michelle Thomas, and I want to say what an honor it is to be here today. Well, thank you for coming out in the rain. Um, I'm also a Georgia public school educator, but I have a different question today. Now, um, it's been in the news that um, voter suppression. I'm concerned about voter suppression. Um, apparently your opponent is trying to stop our voices from being heard. Stacy, will our votes count? Thank you. Okay, so here's how voter suppression works, because you know we've never experienced this in the South before. <laughs> so voter suppression has two mechanisms. One is actually stopping you, blocking you from casting a ballot, and that's what my opponent has engaged in for the last eight years. He has done so by, he's done so by suppressing the vote. He has made certain that people who were legally registered were purged. He, in 2016, we had to take him to court because he legally canceled 34,000 registrations. A federal judge forced him to restore those registrations and said, don't do it again. So he got the state legislature. Remember, I told you state legislatures matter. A federal judge said, don't do it again, but he got a state legislature and the governor to say he could do it. And that's why the 53,000 are in jeopardy. He hounded people in Quitman County, including a woman who helped her blind father cast a ballot. He put them in jail and ha had them go through so many trials, never a single person was actually found guilty. He raided the offices of organizations that tried to register communities of color. And he's also just been bad at his job. He's released all of our information twice. Um, he has been sued by military folks for not letting them cast their ballots because they were overseas. He had to be sued to extend registration deadlines. So that's what he's done. What we have done is register even more people. He tries to take credit. He tries to take credit for the increase in registration. That is despite him, not because of him. But that's where voter, that's where voter suppression works. But where we beat him is on the second part. It's not just how you block someone. It's how you scare people out of even trying. And what our opportunity is, is to confront voter suppression with voter engagement. So many votes that you cannot doubt the outcome, overwhelming the system. Basically an American Idol approach to voting, okay? So many votes that they cannot tell that anybody tried to do anything different. And so by overwhelming the system, by voting at the highest rates we have ever voted before, by doing so early so we can figure out the kinks in the system, by doing so everywhere so that they can't count on small communities being the ones that they can rig the system. 
It is about us overwhelming the system with our democracy. Our votes will count if we put enough of them in that they cannot be ignored. That's how we win this election. And I know one of the most, uh, as we were speaking earlier today, uh, and I asked what would be the first thing you do as governor, you were talking about the shameful numbers for the state of Georgia when it comes to healthcare. Uh, my first 100 days, our first priority is the expansion of Medicaid in the state of Georgia. Georgia is the number one state for maternal mortality in the nation. More women die within a year of giving birth than anywhere else in the country. More infants die than almost anywhere else. We're not quite number one, but we're up there. We have 79 counties that do not have an OBGYN. We have 64 counties without a pediatrician. We have nine counties without a doctor. We have more people who could be served by Medicaid expansion than anywhere else except for two states. And it is not because we can't afford it. Georgia can afford Medicaid expansion. Raise your hand if somebody said, give me a dollar and I'll give you nine dollars back. If you take it. If you wouldn't, I want to see you after this. That's what Medicaid expansion is. Medicaid expansion is giving access to health insurance to the poorest Georgians. Because right now, Georgia has the meanest, poorest Medicaid program. Right now in Georgia, you have to be age, blind, disabled, pregnant woman, and only if you qualify. Or if you, are a sing you have to be a single parent with two kids or two parents with a child, and you cannot make more than $7,500 a year. That's what we consider eligible for Medicaid. It is one of the mean, it, I think only one state is meaner than we are. And the reality is Medicaid expansion will mean that if you make more than $7,500 and less than $17,000 if you're a single person, up to about $40,000 if you are a family of three, that will give you access to health insurance. And why this is so important is that every single one of us pays for every person who shows up at the hospital without insurance. We spend $1.75 billion a year in Georgia on what's called uncompensated care. That means somebody had to get sick, somebody got sick and couldn't afford it. They still get help. And so we either can pay the bill now or we can pay the bill later. And the federal government has said is if we will put in our portion, $1, they will give us $9 back. We will put in and basically $250 million. We will draw down three billion dollars a year in the state of Georgia. And for those of you who don't think it affects you, raise your hand if you think your premiums are too high. In states that have expanded Medicaid, premiums have gone down by between an average of seven to 10% for everyone because when the cost of healthcare goes down, it goes down for all of us. That's why Medicaid expansion matters to every single person. I know. I can. I see your faces. That's. I. I just heard those those stats this morning, and it, it's like a third world country where women are. W why are women still dying of childbirth in the state of Georgia? Makes no sense. You know, one of my favorite uh, understandings about life is that God can dream a bigger dream for you than you can ever imagine for yourself. I lived through that, and I actually get to live God's dream for me because I surrender the dream. If you had to surrender the dream you have for Georgia to the higher power that we call God, what is the dream for Georgia that you wish to surrender? I, I truly believe that, every, I believe poverty is immoral. I think it is economic, it is. It is, it is a squandering of human capital. Some of the brightest, most innovative people I've ever met are people who are just trying to stay alive. They're in our prisons. They are not going to our high schools because they can't afford to get there because their parents have them out working because that's the only way they can make a living. I want poverty to be eradicated in Georgia because if we can solve it in Georgia, we can solve it in America. That is my, that is my dream. Okay, so it's November 7th, you've won. Everybody's now calling you. Go on. 
Governor Abrams. What are you doing on the evening of November 7th? I am taking a nap. <laughs> and hopefully the guy who saw me doing all this is trying to call me to see if I'll go canvas with him the next day. <laughs> You're gonna take a nap. I'm gonna take a, a long nap. Uh, it, this, this has been, thank you. This has been the most extraordinary experience I've had teams around me that are remarkable people. It is the most diverse campaign, I would argue, in America. Not only racially diverse, thank you. Um, racially diverse, our campaign is 46% African American, 31% white, 15% Latino, 7% Asian Pacific Islander. We have people of every community, the LGBTQ community. We have Muslim, Christian, atheist, Hindu, Jewish, we represent and reflect Georgia. And what I, thank you. We have people who I don't think were even thought of at the time I was graduating from college. I mean, it's, we have children working on this campaign. <laughs> but more than anything, we have people in this state and around this country who do not see me as the candidate they see me as a vessel for what they want for their families. And what I want to do that evening is probably watch a little bit of TV first. Um, there's a, I've got an episode of Leverage taped. Um, watch Leverage. And I'm going to take a nap because the next day i got to figure out how we're going to get all this done. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Georgia. I want to thank you, Stacey Abrams. To borrow a line from my mentor mother friend, Maya Angelou, she says, you make me proud to spell my name W-O-M-A-N. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Oprah.